Uh, I'm just going to take a few minutes of your time before uh, the congressman comes up here to give you a little bit of perspective on, uh, on Medicare Part D, which is the topic of our conversation today. Uh, I've spent much of the past uh, several years since I joined Heartland uh, about three and a half years ago uh, crisscrossing the country and testifying uh, on Medicaid expansion and the implementation of exchanges at the state level, uh, pushing back against uh, the expansion of Obamacare. Uh, but today we're talking about something that's a little bit different, which is something that is actually good that was done a couple of years ago that is being encroached upon uh, or attempted to be encroached upon uh, by a couple of folks in Congress who, who think that they want to change something that's currently working, a program that's currently working quite well, in fact, uh, and make it something that uh, resembles more programs that don't work. And that's Medicare Part D. Now, I actually was uh, at HHS uh, under Tommy Thompson uh, at the time that Part D was being created. I then worked in the Senate uh, under Senator John Cornyn uh, during the passage of Part D. Um, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, I think it's a very, it was a very challenging issue at the time. There was a lot of uh, politics and political maneuvering over, over the passage of Part D. Uh, but looking back at it several years later, we actually see a program that, that really does work. It expanded, obviously, uh, insurance coverage uh, for the elderly, for their prescription drugs, uh, and did so uh, in, a, in a number of key ways. It, it had an innovative approach to the, to the issue at hand. Um, looking back at it several years later, we've seen that it's helped lower costs. It's expanded access to these drugs. Uh, and it's a program that's very reasonable in the sense that, you know, even as someone who is naturally opposed to the increase of entitlements, uh, if you're going to do something along those lines, it should look like Medicare Part D. And, and just to give you a couple of statistics in terms of, of uh, the way that this has, has benefited the populace, when Part D was passed, one of the key decisions that had to be made uh, was uh, how prices would be set. And the option was essentially uh, to allow the government to negotiate directly to essentially use their power to create uh, a pricing system or to insulate insurance companies and pharmacy benefit managers uh, so that they could negotiate one-to-one -one and save consumers and taxpayers money by bargaining over these prescription drugs. Um, what we've seen over the course of the years since this, obviously this was something that was passed in 2003, implemented in 2004. Um, just to give you a couple of perspectives on this, in 2008, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services reported that their 10-year projections of Part D premiums would be $50 billion lower uh, than their original estimates. In 2011, the Medicare actuary found that Medicare Part D came in 41% below the original estimates for the life of the program, yielding a total savings of $264 billion to the taxpayers. From 2006 to 2011, it's been 48% lower. Um, and I don't know I, don't, I probably don't need to tell you, but working in healthcare policy, working in entitlement policy for the, nearly the entirety of my career, the number of programs that I can tell you that come in under budget and on time and actually have better outcomes and people happy is just about nil. Uh, in, in terms of the average monthly Part D premium, uh, between 2011 and 2012, it declined uh, from $30.76 to $30. Uh, for 2013, ex it's expected to be uh, stagnant at $30. Uh, spending increases on prescription drugs in the program have slowed from 11% uh, increases per year to 4%. Um, overall, Part D spending decline is the biggest reason for the calculations of the Congressional Budget Office when it comes to the downward revision of their forecast to Medicare spending. You may have read newspaper stories about Medicare spending less money. This is almost entirely due to Part D. It accounts for over 67% of the projected savings. Uh, even Don Berwick, an old foe of mine who's since left CMS, admitted while he was at the head of the program that this is a program that worked, even if it was one that he at the time uh, was very skeptical of. Uh, in addition to this, we've actually seen uh, benefits that we didn't even anticipate in terms of the emphasis on cheaper drugs pushing the pharmaceutical industry to be more innovative. Essentially, you can't just push things forward as a pharmaceutical company by standing pat or by doing the same thing anymore. You need to be truly innovative within this space uh, to have significant gains. And we think that that's the side benefit of this is, is good. Uh, unfortunately, there's some folks on the Hill uh, who are skeptical of this program. They still essentially want to roll it back to that initial perspective that they had of wanting the government to negotiate directly. And they sell this from the perspective of, well, you know, we can actually uh, uh, save you more money from that perspective. That's not actually true. It's not true for a number of reasons. Uh, but that, that hasn't stopped uh, a number of members of Congress, unfortunately, from introducing a proposal along these lines. Uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota has introduced 
S117 on the Senate side. Uh, Pete Welch, uh, the representative, has uh, the House version, which has 28 co-sponsors. Her version has uh, seven co-sponsors. Essentially, it would take that private sector, sector negotiation and put it back in the hands of the government. Uh, negotiating for, for drug prices directly and having uh, essentially the power of the government's purse behind every single decision that is made in those regards. There's a number of, of uh, House Democrats and Senate Democrats who support this law. Uh, it's currently a partisan law. There's not a Republican co-sponsor for any of it. Uh, we haven't seen movement uh, on this front quite yet, but the fact that it has uh, the emphatic support of a number of large uh, progressive groups tells us that this is something that is going to be tried to push through in the coming years. And so we think it's very important to inform you about it now and, and to have this discussion now as opposed to waiting for it to come to the fore and not have you prepared and know what's really going on. Um, the negotiation model that they're talking about is one that we can actually see uh, in Veterans Affairs. We can see it in the VA. And the comparison is not one that is very friendly to the model that they're talking about. Uh, of the top 281 drugs covered under Medicare Part D currently, only 183, so about a little less than 65%, are available through the VA. Uh, and we actually see that access is lower, choice is lower, uh, which is why so many Part D eligible VA members choose to go into Part D as opposed to staying in VA. Uh, additionally, I think that you can actually see an example right here in Illinois of the kind of idiocy in, in sort of putting these negotiation powers with the government. You can see it uh, in the dispensing fees that are negotiated through Illinois' Medicaid uh, fee-for-service program. It currently pays pharmacies uh, $4.60 per, per, per prescription, which uh, compared to the privately negotiated rate for uh, uh, dispensing fees, that's only about $2. And it just gives you a perspective on how private industry negotiating back and forth can actually achieve savings, not just for the taxpayers, but for the people who are actually paying for the benefit. Um, part D uh, shows the model that we should take when it comes to the approach of entitlements, which is essentially that we should give we should give people more access. We should also give them an exposure to the decisions that they're making, so that they shouldn't have uh, essentially no no uh, attachment to the price of the good that they are purchasing. You know, one of the lines that I use and have used you know across uh, the country is that no one cares how much something costs if someone else is paying for it. And I think that that's very true of the entitlement expansion and of Obamacare generally. Uh, you can't insulate drug price negotiation uh, from the private sector without having negative outcomes for the people involved and inevitably going down the road to rationing, to fewer drugs, and to having, it, uh, having that decision be made not in people's homes, not in terms of their own finances, but in Washington and in the government. That's something that we think is very negative for everybody involved and results in worse outcomes for everyone. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce Congressman Peter Roskam, who is our uh, honored guest today. Uh, the congressman obviously represents the, the 6th District. He has a long history in Illinois in both the House and the Senate. And we're honored to have him join us today to say a few more words about this program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction and the opportunity to be together today and to have a discussion about these issues that have so much attention and are really the focus of so much of the spending debate. What I'd like to do is take a running start at this. In order to take a running start at where we are in this health care debate, you really have to go back right after World War II. And it's pretty well settled doctrine that post-World War II, the federal government made, upon reflection, a bad decision. And the decision was to impose wage and price controls on the economy, which didn't work out too well. And what ended up happening as a result was the natural relationship between insured and insurer became broken. And here's what I mean by that. You had an employer that was out in the marketplace that wanted to compete and wanted to offer a position to somebody, but they were bound by wage controls for what they could offer. And so the smart employer said, here's what I can do. I can offer you an insurance policy, a health insurance policy to induce you to come forward and to come to work for me. Out of that has built and is the foundation upon our current health care uh, system is rested. And essentially what happened, if you reflect back, you recognize that it was the beginning of a fractured relationship. Or, said another way, if you have any other insurable interest in your life or in your business, it is a comparatively 
rational cost expenditure. What did I just say? What I said was, if you're buying auto coverage or life coverage or liability coverage or disability coverage or one coverage or another, nine chances out of 10, there is a fairly decent relationship between cost and exposure. So the reason that that's true is the marketplace is an unbelievably fierce disciplinarian on behalf of consumers. So if a consumer doesn't like insurance company A, they go to insurance company B. Look at all of the ways that we are lured by insurers to go at different, uh, different directions in terms of our auto coverage. If you don't like this company, the other company down the street is only too quick and too happy to pick up that responsibility. Not so on the health side. And why is that? That's because Americans, by and large, are tethered to their health coverage and they don't have the ability to break out. Now, how does that all fit in to what we're talking about as it relates to Medicare? It fits in in this way. Medicare is a program that over the years has largely been insulated from the power of market forces. It's been largely insulated. Remember during the health care debate during Obamacare, there was a subtext that ran through the debate and it was actually articulated a time or two during the discussion of the so-called public option. That was the public insurance company that was going to be set up to keep insurers, quote, honest, according to the advocates. And there was a view that said, well, surely the big carriers who are out there, they are unable, um, their overhead is so high that they're, um, they're, they're eating up all of these benefits that should go to someone else. And the net result was that there was a, uh, an incredible desire to put forward the so-called public option. The story that wasn't told, though, was that these low overhead, comparatively low overhead rates that Medicare had were one of the, one of the cost drivers for Medicare fraud. In other words, Medicare's oversight over transactions was so low and so de minimis that ultimately it had the result of uh, not being adequate in its oversight. So we have in our health coverage system today a system that has largely been insulated from the normal power of the marketplace. And as Ben mentioned, and he gave chapter and verse in very good detail, the, the power of allowing somebody the ability to make a decision, and then that decision, they, they receive the quality benefit, they receive the cost savings based on their decision and their decision alone. It's an incredibly powerful thing. The left abhors this idea. I mean, completely abhors it and is terribly threatened by it. And it's interesting when you go back and you, re, you look at the testimony and you look at the nature of the arguments that were made by opponents of Part D coverage, opponents who were arguing it against it from the left, they basically said that you're unwilling to make a promise to seniors as to what their coverage is actually going to cost. And the, the, the leading liberals at the time offered amendments in the House committee process and in the Senate committee process that would have, quote, guaranteed a certain rate. Well, here's the irony. When you review the record, when you look at their so-called guarantee, if you look at their wonderful plan for seniors, it is actually a higher dollar figure than the net cost today. And it is an absurdity. The presumption, frankly, it's tinged with arrogance that says that somehow the federal government or a federal bureaucrat in a gray building on the seventh floor on Independence Avenue down around a couple of carols by a water cooler has the ability to fix a price point more in a more sophisticated, fair, and forthright fashion than the very people who are out purchasing this service. It is ridiculous. And it is that type of attitude that now I think many on the left find terribly threatening. They look at this and it's the actual the role model. It is the, it is the foundation upon which the Ryan budget is built as it relates to Medicare. Now, there's an interesting thing. 
that happened as the Medicare debate began to unfold, and particularly within these past three years with the passage of the Ryan budget. We were able to say, we're not coming up with some extreme experiment. This is not extreme. This is settled doctrine. This is proven with millions of seniors who have made these decisions, and now they've been able to count on it. Here's the objective data. Here's the objective findings. Here's the false claims of the left as it relates to this. And here's the proof that it is a solid program. So now we're able to go out and make the argument as it relates to what? Premium support. This is a premium support program, and it is the foundation upon which the entire Medicare debate is now founded. It's interesting because when we first started doing sessions in the WHIP's office in the Capitol on trying to build consensus internally, there were some members, and this was on the Ryan budget, there were some members that were reluctant <clears throat> because they felt like it would have an adverse impact on current seniors. Time and again, we were able to go back and demonstrate that actually, if we move forward on this basis, there is a foundation that has proven true. This is not, this is not uh, a scholarly work alone. This is not you know, a posting on a website. This is not you know, an appendix to, a, uh, to Hayek's work or something. This is settled doctrine that even, as Ben mentioned, the Congressional Budget Office has had to revise which way? Down, 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 down. So as you begin to think about this and move forward on it, it is the power of an idea, and it's an idea whose time has come. It's, it also fits in to other themes that I think begin to unlock the Rubik's Cube of the larger healthcare debate. I want to go back to this this Medicare overhead uh, concept here for a minute, and that's this. Medicare has an antiquated system as it relates to fraud prevention, and it is a system that's be become uh, characterized as pay and chase. So, and I'm overstating this a little bit for the point of clarity or the point of expediency, but I'm not mischaracterizing it. So Medicare basically has a system that says <clears throat> we're going to pursue fraud, but we're going to really be pursuing fraud largely after the fraud occurs. Now, stick with me. Let me tell you a quick story. It's several years ago. My wife Elizabeth and I are traveling overseas, and we went to Budapest. And when we were in Budapest, we took a train in, and I decided we got to the city center, and, or we got to the train station, and we were going to go to the city center, and I said, um, hey, let's take a subway. It was a bad decision. Uh, we took the subway, and I decided to sort of try and save a few bucks, and we no sooner got down on the subway, but I was pickpocketed. Within the twinkling of an eye, I was pickpocketed. They saw me coming a mile away. They pickpocketed me, and um, I walk around with a wallet, kind of like this sort of deal. They, they got it, and they were off. We came back up the escalator, and I made the phone call, went to a hotel, and I called my credit card company. And I said, uh, hey, I'm Peter Roscom. I don't know what my number is, but I just got pickpocketed. And they typed me in. You could hear them. Oh, yeah, we've got you. Um, you're in Budapest. Yes, I am in Budapest. Well, we shut your card off already. I said, how did you know? And they said, huh, we figured you were not buying $10,000 worth of tchotchke on the streets of Budapest today, and we knew it wasn't you. Okay, so how do they know that? They know that based on predictive modeling. In other words, incredibly sophisticated software and algorithms that figures out with some high level of sophistication where is Peter Roscom? What is he buying? Is this a likely purchase? If it is, it's going to go through. And if it's not, um, he's, he, we're, we're going to save it. And if it's an inconvenience, he'll rub some dirt on it and get over it. And he'll make a call and, and, and we'll let the purchase go through. Okay, so how is it that the private sector has that technology and that level of sophistication and is able to drive credit card fraud rates down to a de minimis level, and the federal government does it, doesn't. The reason is, it's the same worldview that animates this incredible feeling of being threatened 
by the power of the marketplace. The exact same folks that look at Medicare Part D as essentially a threat to their orthodoxy and a threat to their worldview, as opposed to something that they should embrace and, and run with, instead they, 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 they recede back from these types of things that are out in the marketplace and that are so incredibly powerful. So here's where I think we're going with this. I think where we're going is this whole idea of an idea whose time has come is now upon us. And what is obvious to us in this room, it is, it is an obvious thing. The Medicare Part D has, has over-delivered and under-promised. You talk about a program with a fairly low expectation after it was bannered about and beat up by everybody conceivably under the sun, except the people that had the guts at the time to put it into place. Out of that now has come an example. And examples are very powerful things. Examples really can't be silenced. And particularly in this season, where you've got the vast majority of Americans <clears throat> who haven't really made up their minds, whether they're Keynesians or supply-siders or this, that, or the other, they really have not marinated in all of this economic theory, but they know one thing. They know that if they are able to choose, they're able to make better choices than bureaucrats. They know that competition is a good thing. And they know that Obamacare has been a false claim in terms of its ability to be a restraining influence on anything except job growth. And so as we're moving forward, I think that what we've got to do is we've got to be very diligent in articulating the power of Medicare Part D. And really what it comes down to is an invitation for people to see it what it is. So if you, if you look at Medicare Part D in the context of the great debate about entitlement reform, I think what becomes increasingly clear is that it is, um, uh, it is a gathering point when it comes down to it. And it is a gathering point, again, not around theory, not around articles, but it's a gathering point that is successful. So as we are so hungry in this country right now for remedies that can be a restraint for costs and an increase for choices, I think what we're going to continue to see is an attempt probably on the part of the left to try and debunk and recharacterize and redefine and, and um, revise the history of Medicare Part D. But I think when it all comes down to it, there is something that is incredibly powerful about an idea whose time has come. And we can build on this and we can use it. And we've seen it in the Part D, or we've seen it in the, in the premium support debate so far. So we see what the left's approach is. The left's approach is the Independent Payment Advisory Board. That's their remedy for restraining costs. And there's a way to control costs. It's called rationing, just, un, just unambiguously. Rationing, yeah, that controls costs. Telling people no, that controls costs. Putting people in lines, that controls costs. Picking winners and losers, that controls costs. But where does that power lie? Do we want that power lying with the bureaucracy, the likes of which we see what that looks like with the IRS scandal notwithstanding? That type of authority to decide who gets to do these things and in the, in, in the instance of the Independent Payment Advisory Board, 15 unelected bureaucrats that you can't get to, that you can't get to, that you can't influence, that are completely insulated from a political process, that is no remedy. And if that's basically what the left has to offer in terms of cost restraint, that's nothing. It is a, it is a false claim. So I think we've got an opportunity. We've got to up our game. We've got to recognize that Medicare Part D has been an incredible success. When I do telephone town halls with seniors and I am talking about the, the House Republican effort to take on Medicare and to make sure that it's solvent in the future and to wrestle it to the ground to make sure that it, that it is um, there and it makes sense, time and time and time again, I've gone back to Part D, explained that it is the analogous position of Part D, and you can feel the sense of relief at the other end of the phone where folks go, oh, yeah, I like, I like my prescription drug program. I got it. 
Well, do you like your ability to choose it? Yeah. Do you like your ability, you know, it's not too complicated for you? No. You remember that? That it was going to be way too complicated? i got to tell you a quick story on complicated things with seniors. I was in Estonia recently, the country of Estonia. And Estonia, if you know the story, has basically jumped an entire generation from a tech point of view. They call themselves Estonia, and don't they know it? So there's, uh, there's not a paper check in the whole country, and, and the whole country is basically online. And it's got an online banking system, an incredibly sophisticated online network in the whole country. And we were on a bipartisan delegations, and one of our colleagues from the other side of the aisle, we were visiting with the president of Estonia, and he was telling us about how sophisticated their system was. And um, our colleague on the other side of the aisle raised her hand and she said, well, Mr. President, I've got a question for you. How did you manage it? You know, what kind of program, what kind of incentives, what kind of courses, what kind of initiatives did the government have to make sure that senior citizens were able to get up to speed on their, uh, you know, all this high tech uh, way of doing things? And he, you could tell that this question was he could not relate to it at all. It wasn't even part of his world. And he just simply said, it's their money, and they figured it out. And next question. Um, so here's what I'm saying. Let's build on Medicare Part D. Let's defend it. Let's articulate it. Let's learn more about it. Let's, let's, let's advocate on its behalf, not for us necessarily, but for the hope that this theme and this competition – and this promise can be kept and it can be, um, can be expanded to other elements of our entitlement system that are so desperate in need of this buoyancy. So with that, um, do we have time, uh, Ben, for questions? I'm happy to take any questions that are easy and make me look good. No, I'm teasing. Yeah, let me repeat the question. The question was, the fear of free markets tends to be um, just pervasive throughout the federal government and an incredible reluctance on the part of regulators to trust the market in, and, and the market's ability to find the, the, the price point that, that makes sense. Um, I agree with you completely. Um, and I think the remedy is to continue to build on things like Part D. So here's what I mean by that. If if we're able to, to um, if we're able to, to make the connection, then we can we can we can teach. So <clears throat> overcharacterization is the death of persuasion, right? To overcharacterize something, it, it's like it doesn't persuade people. But if simply we say, well, this works with seniors who've been the beneficiaries of this. Seniors are able to make good decisions about themselves. Seniors are an incredibly sophisticated group of people. And the, the fairness of Medicare Part D has reached the right balance in that um, there's, I mean, actually the carriers right now are competing tooth and nail for this business. And now what, what's the average? About $30 a month. One of the liberals' uh, amendments, they were hoping to tag it at 45 I mean, that's an incredible failure and a, and a miss, missed price point on the part of the left. And thank, thank goodness that they weren't, um, they weren't successful in those amendments. So we need to take those things, unpack it, let folks know, you know that, are not, that are not thinking about their economic worldview every day. They're just trying to figure out how to make it through life and say, okay, look, this works here, this works there, and here's another opportunity for it to work. And I think that what we've got to do, those of us who share this view of the world, we need to invite people to come along. And I have found it far more persuasive to be persuasive as opposed to be preachy. Nobody wants to hear some, some economic lecture. They couldn't care less, by and large. They want to hear, well, you know, show me where it's working. And the good news is we've got a great example of where it's working.
Other questions? Yes, sir. So the question is, how is it that there's not more flexibility within Part D as it relates to the relationship between premium and deductible and, and, and a deductible? And I, yeah, look, there's also a political reality to trying to fashion votes and, and get something done. And to get it, to get 218 people in the House, 60 people probably at the time in the Senate, and a President of the United States to agree. So it's, I'm sure that it had more to do with just the negotiations to get something done, to try and build an internal consensus, as opposed to the merits of actually trying to have more of the flexibility that you're describing. So there's probably nobody... Um, nobody that would argue with the, you on the merits, but they would tell you if you're trying to put votes on this thing, put it together this way and it's going to pass. Other questions? Yes, sir. Look, I think if you... <clears throat> Um, part of the data that isn't probably in yet, and it's and it's not ripe, is the data that would that would go around this notion of the access to pharmaceuticals when you need them, and to the extent that that re restrains future loss and more significant um, outlays in the future. My hunch is, and I've not looked at this, but my hunch is that it's probably you know you probably just may be able to get gathering critical mass on data like that. It's probably not all in, but, but in other words, if you're a diabetic and you have access to, to uh, pharmace pharma pharmaceutical benefit earlier, does that have a restraining influence on the, outly uh, on the outlying years? Common sense tells you it does. I can't cite, I, I can't cite chapter and verse. Maybe somebody else here, um, here can do that. But I think also it, the, the, your question also goes to what's the role what's the role of government here at all and <clears throat> i think that the more i'm in this arena the more i'm interested in trying to improve things here and now rather than win theoretical debating exercises which are really interesting and a lot of fun at about 1 in the morning but they're not particularly helpful when you're trying to deal with governing and restraining activity now. So the fact of the matter is we have a Medicare program, and the Medicare program will be insolvent in 12 years. So what are the things that we can do? And I think the, the folks that were putting Part D together years ago, they were forward-looking saying, this, we're, we're going to get, uh, there's, going to be a, there's going to be a prescription drug benefit that's coming. The, the political winds were such that, there was going to be a, a prescription drug benefit coming. And if you accept that premise, then the whole question is, well, how do you want to fashion it? If you reject that premise and you say, well, it's not coming, we're okay, let's just fight it, then that, that's, that's not irrational, but it wasn't true. You know what I mean? So it was coming, and then the question becomes, all right, so how do you, how do you fashion something that makes the most sense? And that is the continuous rub in public life, isn't it? It is the real challenge of trying to discern what's wise, what do you try and influence that you believe is inevitable, what do you oppose? And and if you've got that figured out, you can call that ball and strike, uh, I'm all ears because it's a very difficult thing to do. And I think there's a lot of, um, part of it is you're never really sure either. It's never that clear all the way around. So it's a good question and I, I, don't, I don't have the whole answer. But I do know that I think we've got a responsibility to do our best in light of, um, in light of the facts at the time. Joe?
I think that the internal contradictions of Obamacare are, um, are, are becoming more and more self-evident, as, as, as you've articulated. The, the challenge with Obamacare is the White House has an attitude, and their, their attitude is real simple, onward, implemented. And they're unwilling, at least up until now, they are unwilling to step back from it. And I think this becomes a very serious political problem for the White House going into the 2014 election. Losing the expectations game is a tough way to go through life. When you create a very high expectation and you overpromise and underdeliver, that's a tough life. Think about Part D. Part D had fairly low expectations. Nobody oversold it, but they were fairly low expectations and it was generally recognized, look, we're going to come up with something. We've got to come up with a prescription drug program, and let's do our best. And lo and behold, it is completely overperformed, which is why 85% of seniors are satisfied with prescription drug. There, there, Part D, there is not another program that can rival that in terms of satisfaction. Nobody, nowhere, no how, no other element of the government hits at that level of satisfaction. So, Joe, in answer to your question, I think that um, it's more likely true than not true that the administration continues to move forward. I don't think that their, their pride, frankly, will allow them to agree to, to stepping back from full implementation. I think there's a sense of panic all the way around. You see Secretary Sebelius now, I would argue, inappropriately calling and soliciting large seven-figure donations from the very entities that she has an incredible authority to, to oversee and to discipline and so forth under Obamacare. And that kind of panic, I think, is uh, an indication of flawed architecture. And probably the ones in the administration that see it and know it and recognize it are the ones that are the most nervous about it. The um, the you know the bandwidth for all of those things tends to crowd out more policy decisions about um, part D dis, dis, uh, discussions. But what's interesting is maybe it's not always articulated in the same way, but it is it is really baked into how the, the budget was formed that Ryan authored. So to the extent that the leadership was involved in that, and they obviously were, there was a real effort to build out from Part D onto premium support and to use that. And then also to go to the country in 2012. Because remember, this is in the context of a highly charged debate around Medicare. And I can remember times when um, consultants and pollsters and, quote, smart people when talking about Medicare, they would say, look, Mr. Candidate, here's your position on Medicare. If you want to win the election, you're for it. That's your position. And you want to support, protect, and defend Medicare and then change the subject and get out and go do talk about something else, talk about taxes or something else. Well, the House Republican majority that came in in 2010 was a group that decided to make a difference. They literally came to Washington not to be somebody, but to do something. And they recognize there is no kindness in saying that you're supporting a program that's going to be insolvent in 12 years. And so rather than receding from that, they broke off from sort of the reigning uh, inside the Beltway pundit talk. And they said, we think we, we know what the right thing to do is. And we think we can do the right thing, persuade the public, and we can be returned to office. And that's the way it turned out. As you know, it became not a referendum on the House GOP plan, but a contrast with Obamacare. Obamacare said IPAB, the Independent Payment Advisory Board, which leads to rationing, makes them absolutely so uncomfortable and so full of consternation when you use that, um, that verb, but it is absolutely accurate. In comparison to our view of the world, which says seniors have the ability, based on aptitude and support when appropriate, to make a good decision, we think we win that case. Clearly in the 2012 election, we won the senior vote return with the second biggest majority since World War II. 
So toward that end, it is now, now it's an opportunity for us to lead and move forward. And I would argue that this is settled doctrine. This is not, this is not um, very, very difficult new ground at all. You recall during the presidential campaign, one of the presidential candidates really ran into hot water on the GOP side when he came out as a critic of the House operation, the House budget, and had to back off from that very, very quickly because the Republican Party, at least, had moved and um, had moved strongly in this direction. And I think based on the election results of 2012, it turns out a lot of independent voters did as well. People want remedies. They don't want avoidance behavior. We see what avoidance behavior gets us. It gets us the dysfunction and, and nonsense that have come out of Springfield. And avoidance, avoidance, avoidance. There's no situation that gets better, by and large, the longer you wait. The longer you wait, the fewer options you have, and the options that you do have begin to collapse on themselves. If we, if we diagnose the problem quickly and early and put options on the table, this is a big, sophisticated American public that when they're given the choices, they can make good choices. And they've obviously made a good choice as it relates to Part D and embracing the premium support model that's cooked into the Ryan budget. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, that's so what you're describing is something that is not so much patient oriented, it's more physician directed. Is that a fair characterization? I don't know. I don't want to shoot my mouth off and, and speculate. But if you've got some insight, um, and particularly how the debate is framed and, and, and how to move forward, I'm really open to learning more. Right, it's just a big number that they're going after. Right, right. Other questions? Yes, sir. There's two things that the House um, the House offered during the Obamacare debate. House Republicans, we were in the minority at the time, but we had a threshold decision to make. One was we can try and improve this bill, and that's what we tried to do by offering amendments. We could offer our own version, which is what we also did, and we can oppose their version. So we did all three of those things. The version that we offered looked at two key elements, and I would argue that that after President Obama was elected in 2008, we as a nation on a broad spectrum had made up our minds on two things. The first thing that we made up our mind on was that healthcare was too expensive and that cost drivers that didn't add any value to the proposition should be eliminated. We had, we had all made up our minds on that. The other component was it was morally abhorrent to us, cumulatively, that somebody with a pre-existing condition couldn't get access to an insurance pool. It just frankly made us crazy and it hit our own families, our own sources of uh, you know, colleagues and relationships. And we, we I think, had uh, a level of clarity about those two things. That's what the House GOP focused in on. So in other words, identify the cost drivers that don't add value. So the types of things um, where the irrationality, for example, of a system which today 
has removed the two people that have the most to say about the cost of a procedure, that is patient and physician, they're absolutely blind today as to what the procedure is costing. So if I'm, I'm a patient and you're my orthopedic surgeon and I come in and I say, hey doc, how much is this costing me? In our culture, that's almost an offensive question. You'll say, well, I have no idea. You've got to talk to so-and-so at the front desk. I don't, I don't know. There's no other relationship, economic relationship in your life that is that irrational. None. You ask a lawyer how much you're, you know, charging. Ask your banker how much you're, ask your mortgage guy, ask your roofer, ask anybody how much they're charging you, and they can tell you. Ask your doctor, he can't tell you, because they don't know, because of the system that has created this absurdity. So part of that is based on trying to enhance consumer-oriented health care, so that patients are now saying, hey, doc, how much is this tell costing me? And more people are asking, so the physicians have to say, well, let me, let me figure out how much this is costing you. So patient-oriented health care, where patients are spending more dollar one than, than in other situations. Another area is the lack of competition on the part of large carriers who are able to dominate markets based on the complexity of laws rather than their ability to service and to win customers. They get an advantage under law that insulates them from competition that you don't see in other, other insurable interests. There's also things that can be done as it relates to high-risk pools, funding those high-risk pools that granted are not free and there's a cost to them that's not insignificant, but it's not a trillion dollars. You know what I mean? So the House GOP offered an alternative. It was scored by the Congressional Budget Office and it was scored as being the only alternative in the entire panoply of options that actually lowered costs. And by lowering costs, because this is a price sensitive commodity, lowering costs actually would have expanded coverage to an additional three million people, a lead that was largely buried. So I, I, I take the admonition and I recognize what you're saying. The good news is that within the House GOP, there's a far more dynamic and robust view that's largely been articulated through the media. Yeah, Ben? Right, it's a hard question. The question is, what, what should the House GOP do right now around high-risk pools? And there's a, there's a period of time from now until the end of the year where there's a group of people that were promised coverage under Obamacare as kind of a prelude to it that don't get that coverage. And the thinking among some was to take some of the, the, the current slush fund, use that to, to fill the gap in, for the intervening eight months, and then abolish the slush fund. Because of the politic, it became a very complicated venture all the way around, and it's not sorted out yet. So we've got a lot more thinking to do. There's sort of this reluctance on the part of some to do anything as it relates to Obamacare, because then you can be accused of, quote, fixing Obamacare. And you can imagine the subtleties of the politics of this, where you've got some conservative groups um, weighing in on one side and other conservative groups weighing in on another side and a lot of inconsistencies and kind of churned up feelings all the way around. So it's not clear to me the best, um, the best way forward at this time. Yes. Let me restate that. What's up with the IRS and Obamacare? <laughs> and the people, right. So if you take this trifecta of scandals, so it's, and, and just take a step back and try and be, an obje be objective about it. Um, they, they all have a different feel to them. And I think that they're going in different directions. 
the the scandal of Benghazi is the scandal that surrounds a failure of duty, a failure to dec- to disclose, uh, a failure to do right by those who were in harm's way, and a grievous loss of life as a result of that failure, and a cover-up and an abrogation of responsibility, and a shameful thing. The Associated Press story feels different from that. It feels as if the press has been carrying the president and his administration for five years, and now they wake up and find out, wow, bad bet. And um, and I think the press will be the disciplinarian on that scandal. This IRS scandal feels completely differently to me, and here's why. The IRS connects with every single person, every single family. And when you recognize the power of the Internal Revenue Service and what they did and the abuse of power and the, the cavalier nature and the lack of straight answers and so forth and the actual lying to the American people when they were asked this question in writing and verbally, um, there was a, uh, it, it, is a, it is an ex- incredibly explosive situation. What the administration has underestimated is they have underestimated vesting this authority in the Internal Revenue Service. You take that, yeah, vesting the authority of Obamacare with the Internal Revenue Service. You take that scandal, the fact that the IRS has the ability to fine and imprison and make your life miserable, and that they've been completely cavalier and and arbitrary and capricious in how they have administered the law, and you wrap up in that uh, the braid of deeply personal health care information, and somehow that's not going to be disclosed, and you've got a situation that is increasingly toxic. And I think, I think the administration has, A, underestimated this, B, has no plan to move forward, and is just whistling past the graveyard right now. They are hoping this thing goes away, and it's not going to go away. Well, it, it, puts, um, it puts a lot of pressure on Senate Democrats in key states that are up in 2014 to, be, um, to look for somewhere to go on Obamacare. So I don't think we know the whole story, but the, the opponents of Obamacare now have an incredibly, a, a more succinct and powerful argument that's not just the coverage issues, not just the false claims, not just the rationing, but now the empowerment of the very group of people that have clearly shown they don't have the capacity to uh, to handle this. So uh, Obamacare may not go away, but I'm getting some body language, and I apparently am. <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Is the attorney general going away also? I think he's on a short short ride. <laughs> I do. Um, thank you, Heartland. Thanks very much for the chance to be with you.